God bless you and you may be seated in the Lord's presence. I'm not giving you one text. We'll go to two or three different places here in a, a moment as we walk through the word today. I want to preach and share my heart for a few minutes this morning in a way that I hope will be of help and encouragement to you. This morning on hope is a weapon. Hope is a weapon. Say it out loud with me. Hope is a weapon. Say it again. Hope is a weapon. Say it one more time. I think many times when we come to something like hope, some of these attitudes, we probably tend to think of it in very passive terms. Well, I hope so. You know that it's it, it, it's just kind of kind of wishful thinking. But there are some of these attitudes and characteristics that we are admonished to and called to in Scripture that if you really understand them, that we are to be very aggressive about. That, that, that we're not just to sit back passively and kind of, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be, but we're to be a, a, aggressive. And when you really embrace it, it takes on faith is like that. Love is like that. And when you really embrace it, that it takes on an aggressive militant nature that there are times that you're going to go through some things in life that it's going to be a fight when Paul came to the end he talked about he'd had we, we put Paul up on some kind of pedestal but even Paul testified at the end baby it's been a fight I fought a good fight of faith but make no mistake it was a fight I fought every step of the way it, it didn't come easy this, this was a fight come on and there are some things like that and, and hope has that dimension that, that there are going to be times that come in your life and on the earth, especially in the last days, that if you look around you, brother, it's completely hopeless. If you're just looking at the circumstances, I mean, you, you, you won't even get out of the bed in the morning. You know, you're, you certainly won't turn the TV on because it's depress, as depressing as it can be. And if you're going to make it, you're going to have to stand up as a child of God and raise your perspective above what you see going on in the natural. And you're going to have to make up your mind, my hope is in Jesus Christ. I'm not listening to all these voices around me. I'm getting Militant. I'm making up my mind that if, if the rest of the world goes to hell on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand and I'm going to make it by God's grace and so in that context hope is a weapon now many of us are familiar with Ephesians 6 where Paul lays out the whole armor of God. And we've talked about that and studied about that many times about, you know, the, the helmet and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. And, and, and he lays it out quite in detail there. And many scholars believe that in there's a passage in 1 Thessalonians that, that we're going to come to in just a minute uh, that, that, that we'll put up on the screen where there he starts talking about a few weapons, but by the time he probably wrote 1 Thessalonians first, and by the time he gets to Ephesians to write that, he's had time to flesh it out a little more. But when he talks about, and we'll come to that in just a moment, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, he describes hope. It's not listed in Ephesians 6 that way, but in 1 Thessalonians, he describes hope as a weapon. And there, while we believe firmly in Ephesians 6 and in putting on the whole armor of God, there are other places in Scripture where he describes some other things that are used as weapons depending on the kind of battle that you're having to deal with. 
How many of you know the weapon you use may vary depending on the kind of battle you have to fight? You don't use the same weapon or the same technique all the time. Even if you're, you know, just playing a ball game. One of the good things about a great coach is that he knows how to adapt his game plan for what he's dealing with at the moment. A good coach doesn't just give the same game plan for every game because he's dealing with a different adversary at different times. And in our lives, there's going to be all kinds of stuff that come. The devil will bring everything he can bring at you. He'll throw everything he can throw. And sometimes the nature of the battle is you better raise up hope as a weapon. You better get aggressive with it and get militant with it that I'm making up my mind. When my feet hit the floor of the morning, I want the devil to say, my God, he's up again. My God, she's up again. Because we're aggressive about it. I'm gonna make it. I'm believing God for things to get better. It's not always gonna be this way. God has a future and a plan and a destiny. He has a hope for all my tomorrows, no matter what I'm facing. And hope is a weapon. And it's described in those terms in Scripture. And one of the things that I have felt called to this last year, I don't know as much that it was a specific word as though it certainly is taking that form this morning. But over the last year, I have sensed this urgency, this impressing on my spirit, this pressing on my spirit that if I'm going to make it and if we're going to make it through the things that are going on in the world, we better pick up hope as a weapon because what we're dealing with right now, the devil wants us to despair. Listen, if you get discouraged and give up, That's exactly what the devil wants. That's what he's trying to accomplish. To overwhelm you, to bring so much stuff. We faced a pandemic. We faced civil unrest. We faced political upheaval, all kind of stuff. And we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow in his hand. And if we're going to fight the battle, and if because I've got news for you, I know what the world looks like, but God's not done yet. I said God's not done yet. He's still on the throne. And hope better be a weapon that we carry hope for tomorrow. <clears throat> now, so I believe hope is a weapon that is precise and intended for the present battle and for the present moment. And whether it's on the national scene, whether it's the world scene, or whether it's your world, and what you're facing and what you're dealing with, whatever it is that you find yourself up against, hope is a weapon. Now there's a verse of Scripture that's probably familiar to us in 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. And it's the last verse in that chapter that we know as the great description of love. Now really, when you read that, it's interesting. Are you all with me? If you put that in its context, we remember 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. But 1 Corinthians 12 And 1 Corinthians 14 is a major discussion on spiritual gifts. So when you come to 13, well, what's love doing right in the middle of it? He's giving us a description of how you successfully live a spirit-filled life and a spirit-empowered life. And in the last verse, he says, why don't you just read it aloud with me? And now abide faith, hope, love, These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, when we read that, generally, we immediately skip to the greatest of these is love. 
Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that stuff's good, that, that, that's important, but the greatest is love. Now, that's true. However, in all probability, the reason that Paul said the greatest of these is love is because love is the only one we'll still have in heaven. In heaven, faith and hope will end in sight. Faith and hope won't really be necessary anymore, but love will endure throughout eternity. And so that is more than likely the reason he says the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope may end, but we'll still have love in heaven. However, look over at somebody and say, you're not in heaven yet. In case you didn't know. And so the point is, it may be the greatest because we're still, it's the only one we're still going to have in heaven. But when it comes to this life and what I'm dealing with in the here and now, I need all three of them, baby. All, come on, all three of them, faith, hope, and love, it's going to take for me to get to the other side. I thank God love's going to last forever. But right here, right now, I better hold on to faith, hope, and love because I need all three of them if I'm going to make it through. Does that make sense? And he says here, and now abide. Somebody say abide. Abide. Faith, hope, and love. Now, Scripture describes these three things as having an abiding nature. In other words, they remain. They don't go away. That as the years go by and times change, How many of you know times have changed? Times change and circumstances change. But he said there's three things that abide, three things you better hold on to. Faith, hope, and love that abide. The years may pass, your hair may turn gray, you may face things that you never expected, there may be things take place that you never saw coming, but you be sure you abide in faith, hope, and love, because that's the only way you're going to make it. See, we tend, the human perspective is that that life is hard and life is miserable and we hope for just a few glimpses of happiness along the way. But that's not the Christian perspective. The human fleshly perspective is life is hard, life is tough, and we just hope for a few good things, happy spots along the way. But God comes at it from the other direction. And he says, if you're a Christian... He says, there may be a few hard things, but on the whole, it's good. Come on, that's a whole different way of looking at things. There may be a few hard moments, but faith, hope, and love abide. You keep looking to another realm because there's something higher you're depending on. Somebody praise him. Are you basically negative, looking for a few, hoping for a few positives? Or are you basically positive, knowing that God will give you grace even through a few negatives that make? Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Because we're talking about being a person of hope, that I hold on to hope that no matter how long it goes on or what it looks like, that I've got hope for tomorrow, that things are going to get better, that God's still got a plan, that he's still in control, that I can still trust him. And no matter what they say on the news, I'm under the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. Even when they put him in a grave, the grave couldn't hold him. There is hope for tomorrow. Now go with me. They're going to put it on the screen. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, But let us who are of the day be sober, 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. He says that hope is a weapon. Hello. It's a helmet. It's a helmet. Now I got to, I know I've read this verse a bazillion times, but I never got this. Anybody else ever have those moments? You know why that happens? Because it's a living book. And for the first time in my life, and this is another description he, he gives of weaponry and different weapons for different battles. But he says, hope is a helmet, or at least it's supposed to be. I never considered that before. Hope is a helmet to protect our minds. Anybody besides me have trouble with stinking thinking? In all kinds of ways. Stinking thinking. Hope is a helmet that protects our minds, and you have to keep your helmet on. There is a reason soldiers, cyclists, and football players wear helmets. Now, I'm about to share something as a point of illustration, and I want to give a disclaimer before I share it that I do not have a political agenda. I'm purely trying to make a, a, a point and use an illustration, okay? So if you, if you have a motorcycle and are offended if the government wants to require you to wear a helmet, I'm sorry, I'm not on either side. I'm just trying to make a point. Okay, so I, I, I have no political agenda here, okay? Now, having said that, you know, that, that, that's between you and Jesus, whether you want to wear a helmet. That, that, that's, that's up to you. A bike helmet reduces the risk of serious injury by 85%. 85%. And, and not just motorcycling, but for all kind of things, any kind of contact sport, anything, folks, a helmet goes on your head, and it's there for a reason to protect you. And the Bible said that I'm supposed to wear hope like a helmet. Now that's a picture. I'm supposed to wear hope like a helmet that it, it protects my mind, it guards my thoughts, and sometimes it may be key to my survival. Sometimes it may be key to my survival. Again, I don't have a political agenda, but I got, I got enough sense to know that if I'm going down the interstate and some, I'm on a bike and something happens and there's a semi coming up behind me, my chances are a whole lot better if I've got a helmet on. It's just the way it is. And I came to tell somebody this morning, child of God, when you go through this dangerous world, your, your chances are a whole lot better if you've got the helmet of hope on your head. <laughs> now, I don't know if that gets a hold of you the way it does me. But I'm talking about a spiritual application. Anybody besides me ever had some moments in your life that you crashed into something you weren't expecting to and you went to pieces and if I'd had my helmet on, if I'd had hope surrounding my thoughts and my brain and my expectations, it would have made a whole world of difference if I'd had some hope somewhere along the way. There are some of you here this morning who have been in some dark places and 
you struggled because you did you couldn't see any way out but one day somehow Jesus came into the room just like he did for the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and his light began to shine and you began to see hope and possibility where you didn't see it before because when you have hope you're not just looking on what you can see you're standing on the unseen and on the promises of God's word I'll tell you one of the things got a hold of me in that. Sometimes, you know, the, the crash of the bus could be bad. But even if the crash of the bus didn't look that bad from the outside, things could still be a wreck inside. And sometimes somebody has a concussion or something happens and they look fine just to look at them on the outside, but things can still be messed up on the inside. And baby, I've had some days in my life when some things shook me because I didn't have my helmet on. <clears throat> to look at whatever I'm looking at through the eyes of hope. Because as such, hope is a weapon, and it goes beyond what you see and what you feel to understand that there is another reality. Put my verse up for me, 2 Corinthians 4.18. Paul said, he's really talking about hope here. Even though he doesn't use the word, he said, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's the essence of what hope is. And in present times, in the world in which we live, I want to tell you again, hope is a weapon. And we better look beyond <coughs> the things that are seen to the things that are not seen. And in my personal life, I believe, and in your personal life, I believe God would speak to somebody today and say there's still hope. There's still hope. I don't care what things look like. There's still hope. You may feel like you're messed up on the inside, whether other people can tell it just to look at you or not, but you can put your helmet on. You can, you can get that on your head so that your thoughts are covered by the Word and by the promises of God, and you're not just going by what you see. You're going by what's not seen. If I, can, if I can get there, and some of it is getting in the Word and getting the Word in me. Walking by faith and not by sight. And getting to a place that hope is a helmet. And I've got my helmet on. There may be times, and I'll move on here in just a second. There may be occasions that you, the Holy Spirit will check you. Something happens, there's a crash looming, and immediately you're starting in your thoughts to go to a bad place. And the Holy Spirit will check you, and you'll say, oh, wait a minute, I need to get my helmet. I need to get my helmet and put my helmet on, my helmet of hope, and believe that God is still in control of this situation and he has a good resolution even when it may not look like it at the moment. Now there's a wonderful statement of hope. I think it's maybe one of the greatest statements of hope in all the word of God. It's gonna come up on the screen, First, First Kings Chapter 17, verses 13 and 14. Now, before we look at that, look at me. You remember the story when Elijah, of course, he's dealing with Jezebel and Ahab and all the mess going on and things are looking bad and there's drought and the brook dries up. You remember that? And God sends him to the widow of Zarephath. To provide for him. And he gets there and she says, Well, sir, all I have left is a little jar of flour and a little bottle of oil 
and I'm going to fix that for me and my son, and then we're going to die. You remember that? I mean, it was as hopeless, it appeared to be as hopeless a situation as could possibly be, as anybody in this room could be facing. It appeared to be from the natural an entirely hopeless situation. But you got to get your helmet on. Come on. The doctor may say one thing. Thank God for doctors. But i got to get my helmet on. The financial statement may look one way. But i got to get my helmet on. My past may dictate a certain outcome, but I got to get my helmet on because God has the final word. Now look at this. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward. Somebody say, and afterward. Say it again, and afterward. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. There are two little words there, Sister Linda, that give Tremendous hope. And afterward. I could drop this mic and run around this room. And afterward. Somebody say, and afterward. Those two little words. That means it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. God's not done yet. Things won't always be this way. God has a future and a plan. You can depend on the Lord. It may look that way right now, but there's an afterward. There's an after this. There's something more to come. You can believe God. And I want to remind you today of two little words. That no matter what your situation looks like, God steps in and says, and afterward. And afterward. There's there's still hope. That there's still life. There's still a tomorrow. And as your pastor, I want to encourage you today. There may have been a coronavirus. And afterward. There may have been trouble in your life. And afterward. Your family situation may look hopeless. And afterward. There's still oil in the bottle. There's still flour in the jar. Shatabayata Bahaya. The doctors weren't giving my wife any hope. They thought I might die in that hospital. But and afterward. Pastor, why do you want to act? Plum crazy like that. Cause you weren't laying in a hospital cranked up on oxygen as high as they could take it without putting you on the vent. And about three days later, you came home walking on your own accord. Didn't even send any oxygen with you because and afterward. And Jesus 
is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I probably need to quit, but I'm not in a hurry. Some of you were in a jail cell and nobody would have given you a snowball's chance of ever amounting to anything if it weren't for two words and afterward. And my hope is, listen, hope is a weapon. It's not just a passive thing. Well, yeah, that sounds good at church. I'm talking about something we have to get aggressive about. Listen, it aggravates me. I never was a TV holic. I like to watch a little bit of something decent once in a while, just maybe to relax a little bit. And it aggravates the hound out of me because I can't, there ain't nothing to watch anymore. It's perverted or it's full of fear. There was a pandemic came through and the church about shut down. And in a lot of places it was shut down. But I, I've got news. And afterward. Now I don't know that the world condition's going to get any better. I can't promise that. But there's a whole lot of hope for the church to get a whole lot better. And for the church to finally repent and rise up and be who God called her to be. Because I got news for you. I don't care what it looks like. They may say there's not much left. But I'm here to tell you, baby, there's still flour in the jar. There's still oil in the bottle that God hasn't poured out yet. And afterward, the best is yet to come. Somebody stand with me. Why don't you give the Lord praise? Because you've got hope.